So let's be honest. Christians do a lot of irrational, illogical things, don't they? We're seeing plenty of it right now, as a matter of fact. And I think a lot of those things, when I see Christians make some of the choices they make, I think to myself, I don't even think Jesus would approve of that. As a matter of fact, I'm certain he wouldn't. He would look at them and say, knock it off. What are you doing? But there are some irrational, illogical behaviors that we Christians have that I know Jesus would approve of because he approved of them while he was here. And one of them is this. Have you ever noticed how we turn to God when bad things happen, even though we believe that he could have kept them from happening in the first place? That doesn't make any sense, does it? We experience some type of unexplainable pain. We experience some type of tragedy, some type of senseless suffering. And yet, even though we fully believe God could have kept that thing from happening, he could have prevented that, we still turn to him and ask for help, ask for relief, ask for strength in the middle of the very suffering we thought that he could have stopped. I mean, what is wrong with us? Are we crazy? Are we out of our minds? Do we not have any minds? Are we just not thinking? Are we just naive? This is one of those things that puts a bullseye on us as Christians. It's so easy for people who aren't Christians to criticize. We, they can criticize us all day for that, and I get it because we've all done it. As a matter of fact, for some of you, this is a big reason why you walked away from church. You walked away from faith for a period of time, or maybe you've continued to walk away because you went through a season of senseless suffering, of maybe unspeakable or unexplainable pain, of unanswered prayer. And you started thinking to yourself, wait a minute, God has the power to stop this, but he isn't. God has the power to prevent this, but he didn't. And so it just shattered your confidence in God, and you ended up just walking away, which I get, I understand. This is a hard thing to figure out. Why in the world would we turn to God when God could have prevented the thing that we're wanting him to fix in the very first place? That is the question I hope to answer in this two-episode discussion that we are calling Shining Through. Shining through. So let's get right to it. The year is AD 45. It's been about 15 years after the resurrection of Jesus. There is a famine that is hitting the area around Jerusalem and Judea, that part of the world. But the followers of Jesus are experiencing a tragedy much more senseless than that. They're experiencing pain that's leaving many of them going, well, where in the world is God and why would he let this happen to us? And I want to show you what Luke, who was an early historian for the church, and he gives us many of the accounts of what happened there with the early church. He was also a medical doctor. Luke tells us in the middle of all that, this happened. Here's what he says. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. Now, the King Herod he's referring to is actually Herod Agrippa, who is a grandson of the King Herod who shows up in the Christmas story. Well, this is a part of the story that nobody ever reads because it ruined the mood. But King Herod, Herod Agrippa's grandfather, King Herod, when he sent the wise men to Bethlehem to try to find this new king of the Jews that had been born, and they found Jesus and then went another way and didn't go back and tell Herod, what well, infuriated him so much, and, and he felt so threatened by this, that he ordered every baby boy two years old and, and younger in Bethlehem to be murdered, to be executed. So violence clearly runs in the family of these Herods. And Herod Agrippa is no different. He's now ruling that region for the Roman Empire. And, as Luke tells us, he decides, you know what? I'm going to do something to try to put an end to this movement that continues to gain steam, this movement of Jesus followers. So he decides he's going to target some of the church. And by some of the church, here's what he means. He means the high-profile targets. He means the ones who were closest to Jesus, the ones who have the most credibility, the ones who have saw him after his resurrection, spent three years with him before what some people call the apostles. That's who he's going to target. And so Luke tells us his first target is this, that he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. This is not James, the brother of Jesus. This is a different James, James, the brother of John, as in Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Maybe you've heard all of those names together. This is a James that spent three years following around as a disciple of Jesus. And Herod decides, you know what? We're going to execute him. So he has his head cut off. And when he has his head cut off, it is a big blow to the morale of the early Christians. But Herod discovers it actually earns him major political points. If you're wondering, well, why would he even do this? Well, it's because the people who weren't Jesus followers, the powers that be there in and around Jerusalem, those Jewish religious leaders, they want this movement stopped as much as anyone. 
So anytime Herod could do something to make them happy, it gave him more political capital to keep them in line with him, which kept him in line with the Roman Empire. Anyway, when Herod sees all of this and realizes that, you know what, this has earned him some major influence and some major political points, he decides, well, if James was good, a bigger fish would be even better. And so Luke tells us this, that when he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. Yeah, that Peter, that Peter. So now he's in jail, and Herod's plan is to cut his head off as well. Now, before we go on with the story, this is a little encouraging to me, and maybe you'll find it encouraging to you as well, that the men and the women who followed Jesus in the first century, well, they walked through the same valleys of senseless suffering, of random acts of violence, of persecution, of unexplainable pain, of unanswered prayers. They faced all of these things just like us. But here's the thing. They continued to keep their trust and their confidence in God in spite of that. Why in the world would they, would they do that? I mean, if anybody deserved to be protected, what well, ought to be them, wouldn't you think? But they continued to follow God. They continued to trust God. They continued to turn to God even when bad things happened. And even though they knew and believed that God could have kept them from happening in the first place. So now Peter, one of their key leaders, well, he's sitting in prison. And here's how Luke tells us it unfolds. He says, this happened during the festival of unleavened bread. So King Herod picked the perfect time. This is a religious festival that happened in Jerusalem. And the streets of Jerusalem would have been packed with Jewish people. The, the city swelled sometimes to two or three times the normal size. People were everywhere. So this was a key moment, and Herod couldn't execute Peter during the festival because it would violate some religious rules. But what Herod decided to do was execute him the day after. And so basically, he sent the word to everybody, hey, I've got Peter in prison here, and you guys just stay for the after party the day after the festival. We'll go ahead and have a public trial. We'll cut his head off, and then we'll all have a feast. We'll celebrate. So Luke tells us, after arresting him, they put Peter in prison. He, this is his plan. He's handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. He's not messing around. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the day after the Passover. This is going to earn him so many political points. He continues. Luke says, so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. And there is our tension, isn't it? There's the behavior that you're going, well, that's so irrational. That's so illogical. Why would you do that? Do you just blindly believe? I mean, why in the world would you turn to God when God could have prevented the bad thing from happening to begin with? And he didn't. As a matter of fact, for these early followers of Jesus, they seem even more irrational because these Jesus followers are asking God to deliver Peter days after God did not deliver James. Let's be honest, why bother? Why bother asking God to do something for Peter if, first of all, if God really cared about Peter, he could have kept him from being arrested to begin with? And why bother asking God to free and release and rescue Peter when clearly he didn't answer their prayers and rescue James? I mean, if he rescues Peter, does that mean that he cared about Peter a lot more than he cared about James? This just makes no sense whatsoever. Why turn to God? Why turn to God? When he didn't do anything for James, why expect him to do anything for Peter? Are they crazy? Do they have a misplaced hope? Well, the answer to that is no. And part of the reason we know they don't have a misplaced faith in God is because, well, we're sitting here with the same faith in the 21st century. 2,000 years later, that faith continues to be passed down. And, spoiler alert, but Herod doesn't actually get to execute Peter. As a matter of fact, Peter is freed. He escapes. He spends the next 15 years as a fugitive on the run before he's eventually arrested and executed by King Nero. But we'll get back to that story next time. In that 15-year period, Peter, as he's on the run, as he's hiding, and to this day, we don't know exactly where he was, but as he's on the run and he's hiding, Peter writes a couple of letters, probably more than two, but we still have two of them today, two letters to Jewish Christians who are spread out all over the Roman Empire at that point. And they're spread out. They, they began in Jerusalem, but they had to scatter because of persecution. 
So these are Jewish Christians who are experiencing unanswered prayers. They're experiencing unexplainable pain. They're experiencing some senseless suffering. They're seeing God not show up and prevent things even though they believe he has the power to do it. And so Peter writes to them as he's experiencing the same thing to encourage them, to remind them how they can shine through in the middle of their suffering. And I want to read you just a little bit of what he writes at the very beginning of his first letter. This is so interesting that Peter would have this perspective as he is on the run as a fugitive, as he has watched some of his closest friends be executed, and as all the rest of them are fugitives with him. Here's what he says. He says, Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. To which if I'm reading this, to be honest with you, I'm looking back at Peter and going, whoa, whoa, whoa. What is there to praise God for? You've been beaten several times. You've been flogged. You've been arrested more times than you can count. You're in hiding right now. You don't know if you're going to live to enjoy another day. Why in the world, with all the scars you carry on your body and with all the scars you've experienced in your life, Peter, why would you still have an attitude of going, oh, God's incredible. He's, he's worth us praising. Well, Peter says, let me tell you why. Because in his great mercy, this was Peter's perspective, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If you want to know why you should shine through and keep believing and hold on in the middle of your suffering, Peter would say, this is it. It's because my hope, it's because our hope, it is not anchored to our circumstances. It's not anchored to how well life is going in the moment. Peter would say, my hope's not even anchored to my beliefs. It's not even anchored to my theology. Peter says, my hope is anchored to the resurrection, to the resurrection. Now, here's why this is so significant. If you or if I had a chance to talk to Peter face to face, and we looked at him and we said, Peter, wait a minute, why should we keep believing? Why should we keep trusting? Why should we keep following? I, I don't think it's worth it anymore. I mean, God's not answering my prayers, and I'm a little angry with him because he didn't do that, and he didn't prevent that, and he's not showing up here. Peter, I don't think it's worth it anymore. Why would you tell me to keep on keeping on? Why would you tell me to praise God? Why would you tell me to have hope? You know what Peter would say to us? He would look at us and he would say, well, I understand because I'm living with the same suffering. I'm living with the same pain. I'm trying to make sense of all the same unanswered prayers. But then Peter would say, here's what I know. I was there and I watched when God in human flesh, when Jesus was flogged, he was beaten, and when love personified hung on a Roman cross, I saw it with my own eyes. So you may look at all your circumstances and think there's no way God could care about me. There's no way God could love me. But Peter would say, no, no, no. I saw with my own eyes how much God cares about me. I saw with my own eyes how much God loves you. So I know your circumstances are difficult. And I know things don't make sense. And I know you have questions about why God's not doing certain things and you don't have any answers. And you may not have any answers for a long time. But you don't have to doubt God's love for you. You do not have to doubt whether he cares about you. Because Peter would say, I saw him hang on a cross for you. I saw him hang on a cross so you could be forgiven. I saw him hang on a cross so he could have a relationship with you. And then Peter would say, I lost hope. I lost complete hope for three days until the tomb was empty. And still I was skeptical. Still I didn't believe. Still I thought, well, somebody stole his body. There must be an explanation. Until that night, I saw him with my own eyes. I touched him with my own hands. I had dinner with him. A few days later, I had breakfast on a beach with him. A few days later, I was in another conversation with him. So this is why Peter would say, I have a living hope. Yes, life is difficult. Yes, it's painful. Yes, it doesn't make sense. Yes, I keep turning to God when bad things happen, even though he could have kept them from happening in my life. But I do it because I saw with my own eyes. So I don't doubt anymore. My hope is anchored to the resurrection. I have a living hope because I know for a fact, you can trust me, he would say, that Jesus is alive. He did rise from the dead. And I have no doubt that he cares about me. And then Peter goes on. He says, oh, and by the way, the best is still to come. Peter would say, I'm confident in that. He goes on, he writes this. He says, and into an inheritance, also have hope in an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance... He says, well, it's kept in heaven for you too. Well, Peter, what do you mean by an inheritance? To which Peter would say, okay, here's what I mean. This life we're experiencing, what's well, not all there is. This life we're experiencing, well, 
it's almost like a trial run for real life. In other words, Peter's point of view was, we are not yet living the life we were designed by God to live. The sin, the sorrow, the suffering, the pain, the unexplainable circumstances and tragedies and senseless violence that we experience, it's all a result of sin breaking this world. We're not yet living the life God designed us to live and the place God designed us to live it, but Peter says it's coming. It's certain. One day we're going to die in this life, but it's going to trigger us being able to live the life we were created to live. God's got an inheritance. He's got a better life waiting for you and me. And when you get to that point, Peter's perspective was, well, then you'll realize it was all worth it. When you get to that point, then things will begin to make sense. When you get to that point, then, then you're going to see that that suffering that we experience that's been caused by the, just the mess that sin created in this world, well, God's going to restore everything. He's going to make it all new. He's going to wipe it all the way. And we're not going to spend an eternity with him floating on clouds, singing songs. No, we're going to spend an eternity with him living the life we were created to live. So Peter, on the run, imagine this, on the run, not knowing if he's going to have another day to live, pens words that says, I'm okay. I've got a hope. I can't explain everything we're facing right now. But there's an inheritance for you. There's an inheritance for me. And that hope that we have is all anchored in the fact that Jesus came back to life. I saw him with my own eyes. And you can trust whatever he said to you about your future because he rose from the dead. He proved he is who he claimed to be. So if we were sitting talking to Peter, I think this is what he would tell us. He would say there's hope even when there are no explanations. There's hope even when you don't have answers. There's hope because you can be confident that God is who he says he is, that Jesus is going to do what he promised you he would do. And in the meantime, he's with you. Now, this is why this whole thing encourages me so much, and maybe you'll be able to relate to this. One, I just find it encouraging that the men and women who followed Jesus there in the first century, the men and women who were closest to him, the men and women that, well, we know, we have no doubt, Jesus loved them deeply. They were not immune to the valleys of senseless suffering, of random acts of violence, of persecution, of unexplainable pain, of unanswered prayers. They weren't immune to any of that. They faced it all, and not that we're comparing, but it's probably a lot worse than what we're facing. They faced it all day after day after day. But they did not lose faith. They did not lose confidence in God because they were certain. They were certain he loved them. They were certain that he cared. And so they continued to turn to God when bad things happened, even though they fully believed God could have kept it from happening, and they didn't have answers as to why he didn't. But it was okay. They were not going to question God's character based on their circumstances. Who God was and how he felt about them. When in their minds, that had been sealed at the crucifixion and the resurrection. The other thing that encourages me about this is those early followers of Jesus, well, they made it very clear that they were confident in God's present presence and their future inheritance. They were absolutely confident that no matter what they were going through, God really was with them. He hadn't abandoned them. No, he hadn't prevented it, but he was walking with them through it. And they were 100% certain that while they were feeling the effects of sin and suffering and sorrow and death right now, it would not last forever. That there was a future for them that God had prepared that was way better. It was a life they were designed to live, and it was a life free of sorrow, sickness, suffering, and death. There'd be no more tears. There'd be no more pain. And Peter believed that that future inheritance was so extraordinary. It was worth whatever pain, whatever difficulty, whatever challenges they faced right now. So in the future, they were certain God was going to redeem everything and restore it to what he originally intended it and intended us to be. But in the meantime, they knew he was with them. And so they carried a hope, even though they had no explanations. And you can, and I can as well. I don't know what you're facing right now. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what it is that's creating pain for you. I don't know what's, what's a, a spark of anxiety in you. I don't know what it is that's causing you to lose sleep. I don't know what it is that you're just praying and begging God to change. And I totally understand how discouraging it can be when you get unanswered prayers, when there's just silence, when you're not sure what's going on. 
But here's what I know. You can be confident that God is with you. You can be confident that he cares. And you can be confident that he has a better future for you. You see, this is what allowed them and this is what can allow us to shine through in the middle of our suffering. This hope that they had that was anchored to the resurrection. It's why Peter later was able to pin the words, just cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Yeah, but you're a fugitive on the run, Peter. I know, but he cares. I have no doubt. I saw him hang on a cross. I know he does. This is what enabled Paul to pin the words. You can approach the throne of grace with confidence to find mercy and grace to help in your time of need. He's going to be there with you right in the middle of whatever you're going through. This is what enabled these early followers of Jesus to shine through and continue to give generously. As a matter of fact, the believers in Antioch, in the middle of their immense suffering, they gave a huge gift, monetary gift, far beyond what they could afford, and they sent it to Jerusalem to people who were suffering even more because of the famine. It's why they were able to give so generously, because they held on to a hope that what they're experiencing now, this world, it's not all there is. This hope in the resurrection, it's what allowed them to shine through, not just giving, but in serving one another. It's what allowed them to shine through and love one another so deeply, to love one another the way Jesus had loved them. But it's what allowed them to shine through and love the very people who were creating the pain for them to begin with. And it's what will allow you and me to. There is hope even if there are no explanations for you. Because Jesus died. But he rose again to prove forever that he cares about you and that he's with you. So there's hope. Because your hope is not anchored to your circumstances. And your hope is not even anchored to some theology. Your hope is anchored to the resurrection and the fact that Jesus is who he says he is. He'll do what he said he would do. And he loves you. He loves you no matter what you're going through. And if you will look around you, if you'll pay attention, you'll see there is evidence of his presence and evidence of his love. Even in the middle of your pain, there's evidence all around you. You just need to look to see it.